Hey guys, welcome back to Manufacturing Talks. I'm Jim Vodosky. It's episode 100. <laughs> yes, thank you. Episode 100. It's here. We finally made it. And uh, to celebrate, we've got one of the best guests ever. His name's John Farabee. And interestingly, he's the only other person whose voice has appeared on every single one of these shows with me because he's the gravelly voice guy on the intro and outro at the start and finish of this show. Been on every one. I appreciate that from him. But the other thing too is he is super intelligent and, and super thoughtful supply chain guru. And so he and I are gonna talk about all things supply chain, the good and the bad and the ugly. And uh, hopefully you get some lessons out of it. John's joining us here in just a minute on Manufacturing Talks. Stay tuned. Welcome to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vinosky. Industry has a million cool stories, and Jim talks to the movers and shakers who are making them happen. Let's dive in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Manufacturing Talks. I'm Jim Vinosky, your host. Welcome, and um, welcome especially to my guest today, John Farabee. He is VP of Supply Chain and Operations for a French uh, cosmetics and beauty manufacturing company. And also, most importantly, he's the other person who has been involved in every episode of this show as my gravelly voiced voiceover guy, front and back on my intro and outro. So welcome, John. Thank you, Jim. It's a real pleasure to be here on your 100th episode and congratulations 100 on that. that's why john is here you know i was telling him i was racking my brains who's the right guest who's the right guest um you know thought about folks like you know um um ceos and superstars and and actors and singers and then i thought no 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 there's one other person who's contributed to every single show on air and that's john and plus he's a supply chain guru why haven't i had him on before <laughs> so very glad to have you here john i really appreciate it jim it's a real pleasure to be here well so before we dive into that supply chain guru-ness that you bring us um just tell us you know your background how you got doing what you're doing today sure you know i was um actually early in my life while i was in high school i got a job at a small warehouse and um, production facility around the Chicagoland area. Uh, they did a lot of paint and uh, construction material, just delivery and distribution and sales and uh, just worked part time. And uh, I loved the the warehouse atmosphere and I loved the production elements and uh, was able to drive trucks a little bit later in my time working for the company. and. Mm -hmm. um, just really enjoyed it. And I, and I stuck with it while I went to college. I worked full-time, went to college full-time for a little while, and then worked full-time with the college part-time for a little while. And uh, eventually ended up um, managing uh, a small warehouse in the Chicagoland area for another company uh, before being picked up by broadline retailers. And I worked in the, you know, the kind of decentralized planning of a small facility in the Chicagoland area for a paint and chemical manufacturing company and uh, did a lot of my own planning at the location level, my delivery schedules and, uh, and things like that. And so to get the opportunity to work for a fortune 500 company where I was in centralized planning was one of those dreams that I always had. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, imagine I just finished my degree, got my bachelor's degree, and then I got picked up by this company and, uh, my work ethic, was I think pretty good because uh, everything they threw at me, I took care of and mm -hmm. I quickly climbed the ladder. And uh, before I knew it, I was uh, doing uh, all sorts of different elements of supply chain, working with manufacturers, uh, combining that, that, doing the whole SNOP process, combining yep. all of the elements of demand planning and supply planning and uh, working with the manufacturers to make sure that we didn't run out of supply. I learned a ton uh during those those years uh until i got to the point where i kept asking more and more and more questions mm -hmm. uh, like why are these forecasts so poor right how can i improve these forecasts and then i started digging into 
the analytics of those forecasts and how to improve it and got into the systems side of things until I was picked up by other companies to help um, with the forecasting and planning at the central level on a kind of a global scale. So I just went to different companies that transformation projects around inventory management, supply chain planning yep. uh, before um, later I finally landed back kind of full circle where I am today, where I'm running the uh, warehouse operations, the supply chain planning, the forecasting, uh, and everything uh, that I have today for um, North America. So it's great to take all the things in my early career that I knew at the ground level mm -hmm. and be able to lead uh, folks at the, uh, at the macro level um, across all of those different pieces of planning and forecasting and SNOP and operations and logistics and everything. Um, I just, I'm a big fan of supply chain and I love it. So i um, very happy to be where I'm at today. Yep. And also unlike most of my guests, John and I actually work together um, at a major regional grocery chain. So in that work uh, relationship, I got to see all the cool stuff you brought to the table, but we also then also got this uh, supply chain executive uh, certificate. That's right. And we were teammates on this thing where um, it was amazing the stuff that you came up with for our project on that. So I've always been a big fan of what you have as far as insights and knowledge when it comes to supply chain. And I, I mentioned before we got on here, you know, even though we focus on manufacturing, obviously that's closely affiliated with supply chain and, and it comes up all the time because of these crazy contortions we've been through over the past few years with COVID and now the the uh, disruptions in the Middle East, you know, the, the Suez Canal getting corked up, you know, all this crazy stuff. So, you know, one thing I want to hear from you right now is what, as people look at supply chains today, what are the top two or three things they ought to have on their minds? Yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, that's a great question, Jim, because if you're, uh, you know, Lou Holtz once said, if you're if you're looking back, you're not looking forward, you're not going to progress, right? You're not going to yeah. win that next ball game. You have to keep looking at next year and how you're going to do better. And I think that's like amazing advice that I always, it always stuck with me. I, you know, I saw him years ago and I never forgot that because um, you, it really is true for just about everything in life, right? If you're it not is. trying to strive for improvement. So I always tie that to kind of that continuous improvement mindset and in everything I do. And I think early in my central planning part of the career, we were always looking for opportunities to reduce waste. You know, how do we do this faster, better with less people? Right? That's always been a topic of conversation. So we always had these right. process automation type things that we were trying to do, right? Uh, we would have uh, some guys that knew how to write macros. So we'd go and scrape the AS400 screens and put it in Excel so we could get things mm -hmm. faster. Um, back before, you know, people were able to pick up that SQL book and get access to the databases and things like that. You know, there was all these different things that we had to do for workarounds to get the jobs done faster. And I think that that's really evolved over the years. And we have so many opportunities for those robotic process automations, right? So like if yep. you take some of the, take like those things that we used to do and you take that same context, but then you make it much more complicated where it can look at multiple different interfaces of data to pull that together. I think mm -hmm. um, a lot of companies should be working on that big and small. And I think, you know, they always have the big topic of AI and machine learning and things like that. Oh yeah. But if you don't start, I think with, with more of the basics of your continuous improvement, you're not looking at how am I doing things today? Where mm -hmm. are those failure notes? How can I do them better? Mm -hmm. um, I don't, think you're going to be very successful trying to implement those tools. You really have to have a great foundation uh, to build that up from. So I think that those are like some of the biggest uh, elements. I mean, that robot process automation, I think is huge. I think data is another element that I've worked for a few organizations that um, they don't have always a great handle on that, on where the data is and how to use that data. So I yeah. think the second thing is uh, that data governance layer. And as it applies to the supply chain, especially including the operations piece, 
uh, whether it's whether it's from the manufacturing side or the warehouse operation uh, operations or tra- or the transportation or even the supply chain planning pieces and elements. So a lot of these things are uh, somewhat siloed in organizations, and that data mm-hmm. isn't always accessible. So before you can move on to using uh, AI and other things, you really just got to get those basics right, right? Yeah. And uh, I see opportunities there. So I think if, that that you know some of those. Um, big things around AI are great for bigger organizations that have a lot more resources, but I think even smaller organizations can use just uh, better data structures and uh, the robot process, uh, robotic process automation to to better uh, improve uh, their productivity overall. So those, those are kind yeah. of things that I look at. And then I you know, obviously everybody's going to be talking about AI for a long time. Oh yeah, uh, you know because because uh, yep. that's a huge piece. Right. But I really think you got to start with the foundational elements. And so, uh, you know, right now I have my teams writing SOPs for just about everything, you know. Mm-hmm. So we have a QMS system and, you know, so we're very disciplined when it comes to quality, but we're not always that disciplined with other processes that yeah. uh, that we should be. So if you take yeah. that same mindset and you start producing uh, SOPs, you can then start uh, streaming those processes and looking at the value and the failure nodes and start looking for those opportunities and start applying some of these uh, these technologies that exist and they're available yeah. and not really expensive. Yeah, I, I I love what you brought up right at the beginning of that, the, the Uholt um, quote, because to me that really leads into the next question and it is around kind of the situation today in the US and I'll preface it by saying, it's exactly what we weren't doing before COVID hit. We weren't looking forward and we especially we're not saying, geez, we've had, you know, a decade, a decade and a half of pretty smooth sailing. Lots of people now in the organization who've never experienced rough times. What do we need to be on the lookout for? You certainly didn't need to foresee a global pandemic to realize that, you know, our just in time models, for example, were a risk. And right. yet it surprised so many people here in the US. Um, and, and to your point about AI, also agreed that AI is a huge benefit, but it can also also keep those blinders on even more firmly, right? Lock you right. into that complacency of not looking uh, forward. If you look at supply chain in the U.S. today and kind of think back of the um, the contortions we've been through, where do you think things stand now? Have people internalized some of those lessons that you're talking about? I, I believe by and large, and um, but we do, you know, you always have to be careful and watch out for that short term memory, right? So yeah. leading into the pandemic, um, I was having discussions with people. Uh, and, and even during the pandemic, mm-hmm. people were saying, hey, look, volumes dropping off, right? On certain things, you know, uh, I was I was running, I was helping run a e commerce operation um, at the beginning of the pandemic. And I was I was really in a fortunate position that I had already planned and started establishing safety stocks and multi echelon mm-hmm. elements to uh, to try to safeguard uh, yeah. what they were doing and to support the sales plan. We had a sales plan. I wanted to make sure it was supported by the supply plan. And I had to make sure that was supported by what the vendors uh, were expecting us to order and everything else. So I already put right. those things in place. And so we survived early in the, the pandemic very well and our over-the-counter drugs and things like that. Um, I had health, beauty, and wellness at the time and um, a lot of the OTC stuff we were, we were really focused on. Uh, but near once we were in the pandemic, I actually uh, transitioned to another company. And when I, when I got to that company, they were pulling, they were in the process of pulling back on their forecasts. And it was a longer lead time manufacturing uh, group. So they had overseas mm-hmm. manufacturing. And what I did really quickly was to dig in and learn about how long uh, it takes them to change uh, some of their processes and how long does it take them to ramp back up and how long is there, uh, are, the, are the raw materials for them to procure. So as they pull back on their forecast, I was asking the question, why pull back on the forecast? Let's just stay the course and even if you start building up, if they start um, being unable to produce, 
you have a little bit more buffer. But if you pull mm -hmm. back too quickly, right? And I think we always have to learn these lessons the hard way. Um, <laughs> right. But but you all, but I, I could tell you right now, there's a lot of people out there that have done supply chain planning for a very long yep. time that will tell you that they were they were probably saying the same thing. I was don't pull back, don't pull back, don't pull back, don't react too much. Uh, yep. Try to react a little bit more slowly because you have to just let things pan out, especially when you have manufacturing processes and cycles that can be nine mm -hmm. months long. Right. Yeah. So if I if I pulled back in June because things started looking a little bleak and I wasn't sure what was going to happen. Um, and then in October, things took back, you know, started ticking back up and I started getting a lot more demand. Well, I've already signaled that nine months from now you need to make less. Yeah. And here And then before I even uh, now I start making more sales and all of a sudden I'm really far behind the eight ball. So. Yeah. I think those are some of the lessons like you have to make sure that you're partnered really well with your suppliers or your manufacturing mm -hmm. teams because you know they all have to stay busy too and you have to just allow some of these things to plan out there's a lot less risk in making slower decisions sometimes um yeah and and we've always known that but i think during the pandemic we were making some more emotional decisions than we should have and then on the other right. side of that equation um demand really took off on a lot of things. Certain things started oh, yeah. spiking. Um, <laughs> yep. And a lot of people were in that position where they'd already pulled back and it became very difficult to turn the corner. And so people were really um, excited and wanted to start air freighting and spend all sorts of money. Then we ran into containers going from $2,500 oh, yeah. to $20,000 mm -hmm. and all sorts of mm -hmm. things happening. Uh, and where, you know, actually the air freight calculations started making a little more sense, yeah, <laughs> once you, yeah. but, uh, but then that was all eaten up too. Right. So you had to get really creative during those times. You know, I think, uh, you know, people were leasing entire ships to get containers over, uh, to the United States for yeah. a period of time, just to, uh, to weather the storm of the demand uh, that was coming across the seas. So I think yeah. there's a lot of lessons there that, um, a lot of us, we, we knew going into it. Um, but I think as we see, if we ever see something like this coming again, or as we even see smaller uh, microcosms of these types of effects occur, we can reference back to those points going forward and just all be um, more aware, right? Yeah. Because I think it brought supply chain to the forefront. People were talking more about the importance of the supply chain uh, than ever before because <laughs> yeah, you know, that, yeah. That's everyone, some of the... everyone heard the term. You know, <laughs> that's everyone heard people the term. never heard it before. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So you know, it becomes it becomes a real challenge um, yeah. when um, when the different elements of the group that you're working with may not understand all those nuances, right? right? So um, you really got to sell it. You got to use those references from the past to help uh, learn, so you can look forward to the future and see the spot them coming again. Yeah. One piece that struck me um, was, you know, I've been heavily involved in continuous improvement for a good chunk of my career. And obviously that's brought huge benefits to um, the, the manufacturing and supply worlds. But when you look at what happened around inventory management, you know, you, you kind of touched on it. People wanted to pull back and keep inventories a, at a minimum. And it's like no one ever considered, okay, yeah, you can shave pennies by by dialing back on that inventory, but if things pick up and you miss sales, now you're losing dollars and tens of dollars and hundreds of dollars and thousands and millions. Um, it's this this lack of perspective around foreseeing the bad times and and realizing that the the potential downside is a heck of a lot bigger than that shaving of pennies potential upside on the front end. That's right. That's right. You know, and early in my career, well, when I first started central planning, uh, one of the guys that had been around that company for a long time was, was my buddy when I first started. And, and he said, don't forget, if you dramatically change your forecast, there's somebody in a factory somewhere that's not going to have a job, you know, that's and right. Hiring that guy back might be more difficult than you would imagine, you know, or so impossible. Yeah. Right. So, um, I've always kept that with me that that that, you know, kind of wisdom never left me because uh, and th and that really helps to keep you from being too emotional in the supply chain. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, emotion, emotions are great. Emotions are powerful and they really can move the needle. You know, I, I've met some, uh, some great salespeople, some great marketing people, and they've done some amazing things. Uh, in, in, and they can, and they have to, they have to be that way to get things done. Right. And to, and to have the passion and drive and things like that. But as uh, I always think about like, like you're, you're, you're the, you're in an airplane and you, you kind of in supply chain have to be the pilot and, mm-hmm. um, and they're not the passengers, they're the fuel in the wings. Right. Right. Yeah. And so they're really helping to, to move that whole thing along and, and you just kind of got to steer it and make sure you're doing what they need you to do, uh, but making the best decisions you can with the information you have. And and for me, it, it really comes down to that whole collaborative circle. So I make sure that everything that the sales team is planning, and I learned really early on to to trust those salespeople, trust mm-hmm. their uh, to trust some of their gut gut instincts, and then go back and try to validate those instincts with data, find the opportunities in the data to validate what they're mm-hmm. saying and go with it. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people may be taught, like, do your best to push back on those things. But, you know, when I've joined other organizations, I've really learned you can trust a lot of those uh, experiences that people have and just validate it with the, yeah. with the best data analysis you can do. Yeah. Um, wrapping up on the situation in the U S what are, Top couple things folks ought to be keeping in mind right now as they let, as they hopefully take your advice and and look forward. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think you know, the, the economy is always going to be moving up and down, right? Yep. And you're you're always going to have different opportunities and um, and and risks. And you know, I'd say across um, across all of the planning spectrum, um, I you know I have wishes for the US supply chain, right? And and I think, you know, we've, um, as I look at and read and, and, and listen to all your um, your shows and the, the theme about how manufacturing was so important in the United States and how we've waned, I think that supply chain as a force, you know, leveraging some of the, the recognition that it's gotten over the last few years, especially with the pandemic, is a good wake up call for the United States to say, how how can we um, reestablish some of that infrastructure that we've lost? Right, you know, there's right. there's there are some barriers uh, to entry from a cost perspective in, in certain sectors, but I think there are a lot of opportunities too to um, relook at things, and um, you know, whether it's from uh, from a CSR initiative or anything else. You know, I was just talking to somebody at work today about uh, the clothing, he, you know, we were, we were actually talking about your show and I was, I was talking <laughs> about, one, one, cool. about one of my favorite guests that, that you had on and, uh, and it inspired me to really dig into some of the apparel manufacturing and what, and what happened there and what, what can be done. And, yeah. and it, and it really opened my eyes cause he made a comment about, you know, the, the amount of um, just waste that could be produced in clothing and how it's been on the forefront of things. And, yep. and I, I imagine, you know, and if you think about, he was saying we were talking about the costs in the United States versus the cost of other places. Uh, but however, right, you have high quality Absolutely. and you have uh, things that could be used much more frequently and, and things like that. So, I, you know, that uh, Dean, when he was on your show, really inspired me to get really interested in that. I, I keep looking at uh, that sector over and over and over again whenever I have the opportunity to dig into it because it yeah. is. Uh, it is important and there's a lot of a lot of different things that are that are happening out there that i think it, you know the united states can can really do itself a lot of uh, good to to look into and find those entrepreneurs that are willing to balance things out again right? yeah yep yeah so um that's dean wagner of authentically american that's look right. him up I'll, I'll put a link in the description um because i agree I, dean's the one who brought me the the fact that um, at this point, actually, when we talked, was, which was two or three years ago, uh, America was making 3% of our apparel. Yeah. And I think it's gone down since then. Yeah. I think um, it's, a, it's a real shame, right? It is. And uh, I'm actually planning to do a Forbes article on some of the challenges of, of making apparel in the U.S. We've actually lost some fabric mills and affiliated businesses over the winter 
because of things that are going on with that, what you alluded to, the, the crazy influx of cheap foreign goods that, you know, a huge percentage of which go to waste. And I do think we need a retrenching around attitudes and, you know, buying things that last and supporting our fellow Americans. Um, I want to shift gears because you brought something up a little while ago that is also near and dear to both of our hearts. You know, you referred to that guy in the factory who, if you make the bad call and he gets uh, let go, you uh, might have trouble getting him back. And it's actually an even bigger problem and will get bigger still in that the numbers of skilled people continue to decline. You know, the boomers are, are retiring. There are most skilled employees and especially in a factory or a, a supply chain setting where uh, it requires highly skilled people. That's where we're going to hurt the most. And, um, John and I share some uh, opinions. We, we've both been involved in scouting. He's got a huge family. I have a small family, but we come together <laughs> on some ideas around youth development. And I think that's going to be so critical as we look at how we shore up uh, right. that, that labor supply. Yeah, I, I think it's really important. And, and you know, I would, uh, I would ask every professional out there uh, to to talk to a youth about um, the opportunities that, that 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 do exist within supply chain all across the board, and um, you know, and and as a father, I will tell you, if you told my son, he would listen, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, so, well put. <laughs> right. You know, because uh, you know, as, as a dad, you could give your kids you know, these little bits of wisdom, but you know, when it comes from a stranger, sometimes it actually works a little bit better on them. Right. right. So, yeah. but I think if we could all inspire each other and inspire the youth to, to come into understanding more about what, what makes America run. Right. And, um, and inspire them to get into uh, different, different roles that, uh, in, in, in different paths that can lead to those careers, right? And, and it, it could be a, a conventional or an unconventional path that doesn't really matter. You know, my path was uh, was very different than most people I work with, right? A lot of people went away to a four-year in, uh, university and I started in community college. Uh, then I went to, to full-time uh, night school and then I got my MBA when I was at uh, a Fortune 500 company. Um, and uh, I never, never went away to university. So you don't have to do it that way, but, uh, yep. you know, I do encourage uh, kids to always give it a, give it a try and go and uh, figure out what they want to do, what makes them happy. But I think it's really important that we do inspire uh, people about what is possible and what mm -hmm. those career paths can look like right. and how rewarding it is. You know, I worked uh, a couple of companies ago. I worked with a guy that uh, was in Rhode Island. He ran the, uh, uh, the blow molding uh, machinery and production planning and he was still 80 years old and he oh, and he, yep. he enjoyed it you know and he loved it and um yep. he he did all the planning and and you know did a great job never never missed anything right and, yep. and he was very happy and loved his job and so those jobs um are enjoyable and they can be uh, great roles for people uh, whether whether it's uh in, in an operation, running an operation, in a factory, running a factory, right? It doesn't, uh, you never know which way it can go. And uh, everybody has uh, a ton of potential that they just need to unlock if they have the imagination. Right. And, and you're right. You know, all of us <clears throat> involved in these worlds of manufacturing and supply chain owe it to ourselves to engage with our youth, with folks in school and, um, educate them on exactly what you said. These are rewarding careers that, that can be uh, incredibly uh, valuable. And unfortunately, we haven't done a great job of marketing them. So we need to turn that corner. Um, the other piece too, you talked about people going away to school and I'm certainly not going to denigrate that. I went away to uh, college and got four, a four-year degree. But at the same time, we also then starved the skilled trades. And so that's put a double whammy on us. We've got the boomers retiring and we haven't had the numbers of youth going into skilled trades for probably a couple generations now. Right. And so that's another piece that I'm actually a little heartened by uh, around now. I, I think I just saw the other day a headline about the latest generation being the tool belt generation that they are mm. swinging back to that kind of work, which 
you know, again, we still need those highly educated people coming out of universities. Um, the folks who go into trades aren't any less educated. They're just differently educated. Right. And they're very highly skilled. Yep. And it still um, takes, it takes a ton of dedication and passion. Right. Uh, for those, those careers as well. Well, and that's a perfect segue because I do want to uh, actually, we're just about out of time, but I want to wrap up with scouting. You know, unfortunately, you got a lot of people who have a, a negative attitude thinking scouting forces a singular worldview, which it does not, but it does instill exactly what you just said, that tenacity, that ability to handle some tough times and some tough situations and still enjoy yourself. Um, I was just talking to my older son the other day. He's kind of struggling with career direction. And I said, you know, you've, you've been through some, really tough things on campouts where it wasn't comfortable. Maybe you didn't get enough to eat because your fellow scouts burnt your dinner, but you right. persevered and you got through it. You can get through this too. That's right. That's right. I, I think there's great lessons there. And with, with anything in life, it's yep. what you put in, you know, uh, has a lot to do with what you get out of it. So this, this scouting is a forum for you to be able to put yourself out there and put yourself into these positions and there's kids that go through scouting that uh, are timid about making a leadership uh, mm -hmm. change, right? Being part of that leadership team. And then they do it. And then the transformation, right? The transformation yeah. that I've seen yep. in, in young folks out there uh, all over the place. You know, I, I'm uh, the personal management merit badge counselor. And mm -hmm. then sometimes just the transition you see people make, these youth make when you go through just that one merit badge is is amazing when they put their heart into it and they want to learn it and they do it uh it's actually quite uh, quite amazing and, and yep. you know um i i've seen my my own sons make huge transformations just going on a camp out without me and coming back and 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 just they 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 there's something that clicks there there's something that yeah. independence kind of kind of kicks in and yep. um, they become you know a little more self-starter about how they approach things in life, whether it's school or sports or activities that they're in outside of scouting. Uh, I think it's actually sure. a wonderful program personally. So, Agreed. Um, I'm going to toss it to you for any last thoughts you have about anything we've talked about or beyond. Well, you know, um, you know, my final thoughts here are, are really just, uh, I'm, I'm very, I just want to tell you, I'm so very flattered and um, uh, thankful to have been on the on the show. I know, you know, I've been the voiceover for your intro and exit for all these years, and uh, I always thought it was it was amazing. And to be in the company of some of these folks that I've I've watched on your program um, is is a is a real honor. So I just want to say that to you and to all the Thank guests you. that you've had because uh, they've all done such a wonderful job and. Uh, and you're such a such a brilliant host, and uh, and I love reading your Forbes articles too. Thank you. Um, but you know, I will say I'm long overdue for having you on here. Uh, it was really cool as we got ready for this episode, thinking back about some of the stuff we did when we worked together. We've stayed yeah. in touch since then because I so value your thoughts and your input. I deeply appreciate your gravelly voice on my intro and outro. Um, and I apologize for waiting till episode 100 to get you on here. We will have you back on. Um, thank you for helping us celebrate this episode in fine fashion. And uh, yeah, thanks for being here. You're welcome. And thank you very much, Jim. It's yep. been a and of course, thanks as always to you guys in the audience. You're why we're here. We're here every Tuesday, sometimes even more. So, um, you know, Definitely um, not every episode is going to be as meaningful as this. You know, John and I go way back and he's helped greatly in bringing that element of professionalism to my show that in other ways was very lacking in the early days when I was getting going and maybe even today a little bit. But uh, yeah, having that gravelly voice anchor in the two ends always made me feel really good about, about the show. Um, so no, not every show will be this meaningful, but everyone's going to be meaningful. So tune in. Thanks again. So long. Thanks for tuning in to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vinosky. Watch for new episodes dropping every Tuesday. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe.